Hey guys, Mr. Marek here. Um, this video is going to be pretty quick and pretty simple, but it's actually something that's really, really important to us moving forward. Um, this video we're going to talk about Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law is the relationship between the amount of force applied to or by a spring, keyword spring, and the distance the spring is stretched or compressed. See, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say spring, you can also kind of replace that word with the word rubber band. Rubber bands can be stretched just like a spring can be stretched. Some examples of where you might see springs, if you had a trampoline in your life, it's the thing that kind of holds a trampoline mat to the frame of the um, trampoline. Springs are also important in things like your car suspension. It's what makes your ride on the road a little bit smoother than it would be otherwise. And we'll see some other uh, examples and uses of springs in class next time. So here's kind of sort of a drawing of a spring that is fixed at the left end. So it's like we attach to something that's not going to move. And initially it's at equilibrium, meaning we're not pushing or pulling on it. And so when it's at equilibrium, we're going to say that its initial position or equilibrium position is just the end of the spring. Now if we were to pull the spring, we would stretch it out. And so it's going to get longer as we pull it. In this case, we're pulling it to the right. And so the equilibrium position is still right there. And the basic idea behind a spring is that it tries to return to equilibrium. That's what makes a spring a spring. It's so the same thing with the rubber band. If you pull a rubber band and then let go of it, the rubber band tries to return to its original length. The way that they physically do that is by exerting a force. So in the spring, there's a force exerted to the left, trying to pull itself back together. That same force would be applied to whatever it is that's causing the um, spring to be stretched out. Springs can also be compressed or squeezed. Uh, so if you've ever had like a spring-loaded dart gun, you basically make the dart fire by releasing a compressed spring. And so when it's compressed, then it's on the left side of equilibrium. And that means that the spring is going to exert a force directed to the right. It's going to try to relax and return to its equilibrium position. So, I'm going to kind of redraw the first two pictures real quick. This distance from equilibrium, we're just going to call it x. That's kind of like the displacement of the spring. And again, we measure that from its equilibrium position. So, it's measured from this spot, not from this spot. This is where the spring wants to be, and so that's where we measure its displacement from. Now the force exerted by the spring is going to depend on two factors. The first one is just how far we displace it. The more you stretch a spring, the more force it exerts trying to return to equilibrium. Same thing is true of rubber bands. The more force you exert, or the, excuse me, the um, farther you stretch it, the more force it exerts. That's why it becomes really, really hard to stretch the rubber band farther and farther and farther. If you've ever used those elastic exercise bands or the um, elastic tubing, um, if you've ever been in physical therapy, for instance, um, you kind of know that there comes a certain point where you're just not strong enough to stretch it any further. The second thing is that, or the second factor that affects the force is just the properties of the spring itself. Kind of another way of saying that is how stiff the spring is. The way that we measure that is by something called the spring constant, which we give the symbol K. K for constant. K, 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 constant. And that quantity would be measured in the unit of newtons per meter. And so the stiffer a spring is, the higher the spring constant for the spring is going to be. So for something like the spring in a watch, which is real easy to stretch out, it has a very low spring constant. For a trampoline spring, which are really difficult to stretch out, 
the spring constant would be really high. For your shocks in your car, those springs have a ridiculously high spring constant. It takes the entire weight of a car to squeeze those things just a little bit. And so the bigger the spring constant, the stiffer the spring is. And so we can write a simple equation. The force exerted by a spring is equal to the spring constant times its displacement. Now we have to realize that, just like a lot of these equations for forces, that equation only gives us the magnitude of the force. So the second piece we have to remember is that the direction of the force is opposite the direction that we displace the spring. So like up here, when we pull the spring to the right, the force exerted is to the left. If we were to compress it instead, then the force would be to the right. So there's two ways that we can modify that equation that I wrote right here to reflect that. I could either put a negative sign in front of the k times x, so that always indicates that this and this are in opposite directions, and that's very commonly written that way. Or I could just indicate that the absolute value of the force comes from the absolute value of k times x, and then we have to figure out the direction on our own. And so the way that that is typically written on um, your formula chart is more like this. That's how it's written on your formula chart. But you see the other way written a lot too. And so we need to just remember this big idea right here. So let's kind of sort of look at a real quick example. Suppose that we took a spring, which the spring constant is known to be 100 newtons per meter, and it's actually a pretty weak spring, is attached to a 5 kilogram block, and then we pull the spring to the right so that it pulls the block to the right, such that the block accelerates at 4 meters per second squared. And then we magically know that the friction force on it is 30 newtons. The question is, how much is the spring stretched? So step one is to draw a free body diagram. Obviously, this block would have weight. It's on a surface, since there's friction, and so it would have a normal force pushing it up. I'm going to draw the spring force going to the right, and then friction would oppose the motion, so that would go to the left. So step one, free body diagram. Step two, net force equation. I only need to worry about the x direction, since it's only accelerating in the x direction. And then step three, use Newton's second law. So since I know what the acceleration is, I can use that to figure out the net force on this thing. And so the net force would be about 20 Newtons. And that would be directed to the right. So now that I know what the net force is, I can use my free body diagram and solve for the missing spring force. And so the spring force would be the sum of the net force and friction. And so plugging in my numbers, we found the net force to be 20 newtons. We knew the force of friction was 30 newtons. And so that means that the spring is exerting 50 newtons of force. So all that stuff was what we previously knew from dynamics. Free body diagram net force equation, apply Newton's second law. Now we can use Hooke's law to figure out how much the spring is going to stretch. So solving that for x, just divide the force by the spring constant. And so I'd have 50 Newtons over k, and k is 100 Newtons per meter. And so that would give me something like 0.5. And then your Newtons cancel out. And so you've got meters on bottom of the bottom of the fraction, which means it's really on top. And so my answer would be in meters. So that's all the new information. Kind of like I said, it'd be kind of quick and um, to the point. So I have two questions that you need to think about for next time. Question number one is how could you measure, keyword in here is measure, the spring constant of a spring, and then question number two,
why do we care about this? Why am I worried about a spring? We don't really use springs that often in our everyday life, at least that we think about. So why is this law really, really, really useful in physics? So contemplate those two questions real quick. Maybe jot down some thoughts in your notes um, and be ready to possibly answer those questions next time. Until then, ta-ta.